Hello and good evening, everyone. Today we have a very special guest for uh, this episode of Viksit Bharat uh, that we organized on behalf of Dr. Shama Prashad Mukherjee Research Foundation. Uh, Dr. Ankit Shah needs no introduction uh, for anybody who is keeping an eye on social media uh, and in the YouTube because of the kind of proficiency that he has. I must say one thing, my name is Pathik come on television very frequently, but if there is one person whom I listen to with reverence, uh, it is Ankit Ji. Uh, and let me tell you one thing, uh, I still learn a lot from him, in spite of the fact that, uh, you know, he's so young and he's, he's so knowledgeable. Among the lesser known qualifications of him, of his, let me tell you, among the lesser known is that he is a qualified chart chartered accountant and a qualified company secretary. But his actual proficiency for which he is so well known is that he is not only just a, a, a geopolitical analyst who has a very keen understanding of issues, but he has been sort of a geoastrologer, we can say. Uh, the things that he had predicted in the last few years, almost all of it has come true. And let me tell you, you are watching a person or you would be hearing a person who rightly predicted Doklam, rightly predicted uh, the location of Article 370, almost with the month. He predicted the Bala court, LAC standoff, Ukraine and Taiwan conflict, and something which has caught the attention of people and policymakers today, which is de-dollarization. Today, we are seeing uh, a different phase of de-dollarization, which has started. Um, Ankit Ji was one of the first person who started talking about it at a time when not many were even aware of what the aspects of it today. So today we are covering an issue called the rise of Dharmic India and its impact on geopolitics, geoeconomics and sustainable development. Uh, we see in the last one decade, there is a phenomenal transformation that we have seen in this country in terms of how uh, there is an awakening of the idea of India, the awakening of the Adhyatmic India, the manner in which um, Prime Minister Modi has redefined inclusive development, the manner and in which uh, we have a spiritual awakening happening in this country where the temples themselves are becoming, apart from everything else, uh, you know, center point for economic prosperity. Uh, for example, in Kashi Vishwanath last year, seven crore people visited the temple and the city. Can you imagine the impact of that? Uh, on the economy of that place. And one of the first persons uh, who actually thought about it, talked about it, predicted it was Ankit Ji. Ankit Ji, um, without further ado, uh, just by making one statement that there's a fundamental transformation that is happening in the world today, led by India. Uh, is one part of that. The becoming the voice of Global South has been another part of it. The entire gamut of uh, development of resilient supply chain or Atmanirvar Bharat or the whole Mudra Yojana that created uh, 8 crore new entrepreneurs. The manner in which, uh, you know, the rural urban divide has been bridged by Jandhan Yojana and everything else. I mean, uh, you know, there is no person who can connect all the dots from the micro to the macro level at the highest point uh, than Ankit Shah. So over to you, Ankit Ji, and we would be very keen to, you know, listen to your valued, uh, you know, views on this once again, because I've heard you so many times. Uh, for me, it's nothing new. Uh, but every time you say something, there is something new thing that comes up, which is, which is astounding. Over to you, Ankit Ji. You're on mute, Ankit. Ji, dhanyavad, Ji. Uh, thank you for hosting me uh, on this occasion. Um, we, are, we are seeing that uh, Prime Minister is going to shortly address the nation yes, yes, with yes. something big. So people are waiting for that too. Um, I come from the state of Gujarat and uh, uh, where we breathe money. I mean, mathematics is a part of it, right? And when we talk about the concept of money, because I see a lot many problems in the world caused due to a fake sense of base thought of how economics is designed in the world, where 
Abrahamic economics concept, which comes from the base thought process that this is the only life. So the rest of the world, when we say they see it as you are the body and soul is just a vehicle. This is their thought process from where the entire economic modeling is done for the entire world. And since they had the benefit of colonization of the rest of the world, they were able to impose those formulas all across the world. Now, Bharat is the only country and the only civilization which says that you are the soul and body is just a vehicle. So there's a fundamental difference between how you design the models of governance, the models of economics, and how rest of the world designs their models of economics and governance. So when we see to it that in this entire planet, if you are going to philosophically take the, the root cause value from where you design how the world needs to function, uh, there are only two places on this entire planet. One is Jammu and second is Jerusalem. There is only two places. Okay. So you got two dharms from the Jammu belt at the Indus, and you got two dharms in the Gangatic plain from the Jammu belt. At the Jerusalem belt, you got two religions. Now, there's a fundamental difference between religion and dharm. And it is so unfortunate that foreign ministers after foreign ministers, I would uh, definitely pin this responsibility on a foreign minister that and the Indian citizens certainly that we are not able to convey to the world what is the difference between dharma and religion. Now, if you are able to clarify to the world what's the difference between the two, then perhaps you would be able to uh, sell your governance models and economic models more effectively rather than uh, you know you pointing out the defects of the Western templates or the foreign templates and going the reverse way, right? So, uh, which I say is the re-emergence of Sanatan economics model. So the rise of dharma, today's topic, when we say rise of dharma, what do we mean? It has two important components. One, one is the re-emergence of Sanatan economics and second is the re-emergence of the power of Asia in the global order. These are the two important elements which needs to go hand in hand to complement the Vikasit Bharat 2047, the vision which the Prime Minister has and the vision for the entire world because I believe that it is the rise of Dharm which will be a global force of good on this planet where we will be able to cut out the ill effects of extreme capitalism with the concept of Dharm and we will be able to cut out the extreme extreme concepts of communism with the concept of karma. So dharm and karma, these are the balancing uh, bring this entire lopsided uh, governance and the economic models which came from foreign templates and bring it back to the Sanatan economics model. So when we say that uh, you are the soul and body is just a vehicle, now, what that translates into in your day-to-day -day life in terms of governance? It translates into working on the man factor of production and putting the man factor of production at the center of every governance and policy or the economic models that you design. So when we see some of the uh, uh, value factors which were uh, written by Pandit Dindayalji in Integral Humanism, we find those elements uh, mentioned over there. Because particularly when, when I give talks uh, at various places, people, people are able to relate and say, ha, ye, ye thought to the hamare back of the mind. But why is it not coming to the fore? So when I complete my speech, we are like, yes, this is exactly how it's going on. So we do have those all those Indic authors uh, and those uh, uh, stalwarts who gave those seed thought process. Uh, the only thing lacking is uh, we are not able to bridge the current position to the ancient Bharat intent that, that needs to be. Now, there are two important elements when I say the rise of dharma and the re-emergence of Sanatan economics model. One is the establishment of the mandiri system. Now, 
this is the criticism which we get from the West, uh, and all those colonial authors would write it that India did not have any institution. So for for eighteen hundred years, if we were giving twenty seven percent on an average GDP, uh, we certainly had some institution, right? So Mandir was the institution, the mega institution which ran the entire economic model as a centerpiece. There is another element which is a family unit entrepreneurship, which goes around with this Mandir ecosystem. Now, when we talk about Mandir ecosystem, uh, you will see uh, there will be questions. Questions like, "Okay, you know, 22nd January 2024, which I say is our civilizational independence day, because we we have we don't believe 19 that 15th August 1947 a politically." Negotiated uh, Independence Day, and that too. Uh, when you see concepts like people telling, in fact, our textbooks writing uh, cannot differentiate between a freedom fighter and a freedom negotiator, right? When Bapu himself says that we are not supposed to fight, right? And still the textbooks are saying he is a freedom fighter. So when you cannot differentiate between, uh, and all of a sudden, I mean. हम तो उस भरत के वंशज है जिनसे राष्ट्र का नाम पड़ा है और पिताश्री जो है भारत देश के अभी अभी लेटेस्ट आ जाते हैं सेंचुरी में तो देर आर फंडामेंटल पैराडॉक्सेस हियर व्हिच वी नीड टू रेक्टिफाई द हिस्टोरिकल रॉन्ग्स सो वी नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड एंड दिस कॉन्सेप्ट वेयर एवरीबडी बिलीव दैट वी स्टार्टेड इन नाइनटीन दैट मीन्स टू बी रेक्टिफाइड नाउ वेयर वी हैव अचीव द सिविलाइजेशनल इंडिपेंडेंस डे ऑन दैट 22nd January 2024. Since that date, you are not surprised the kind of condemnation that the concept of Bharat got, saying that here, there is a hospital to be built. Here, there is a school to be built. Where will the jobs come from? From the temple. Post that date, post the date of the civilizational independence, all that you are hearing is that. Ayodhya will cross one trillion dollar economy later by the end of this decade. So this entire narrative has now shifted after the establishment of the the, the strongest vigraha that you got in Ayodhya. Now, what what we mean by empowering the mandir ecosystem and why do we need to do it? Because there's a fundamental concept, as I said, the difference between uh, religion and dharm. Now. Uh, a temple is not a mandir. Uh, there, are, there are many uh, concepts that we need to clarify. Temple is a place of worship. Mandir is a place where you elevate your inner self. Now, mandirs have been university campuses, center for pre- feeding prasad, food, uh, uh, research, medicine, and all the uh, the yatpadi yatras that used to happen between ancient mandirs were student faculty exchange and research programs. Each mandir had several. Is represented by which Bhagwan's Pran Pratishtha is done over there. Similarly, uh, you know uh, when you see, uh, see the difference between religion and dharm. Religion is a set of organized system based on beliefs in a god or god. These systems often culminate into non-acceptance of existence of any other god or dharma. It goes further into achievement of uh, uh, mob-based uh, objectives, adversely being conversion and takeover. often with blanket separation of treatment between uh, believers and non believers now this comes from the adesh philosophy of strict commandment uh, to define someone is a believer or not on the contrary indian dharmas are all about individual seeking of liberation now the seeking is for the individual to decide based on his own interpretations and capacity now the dharmas come from the upadesh philosophy of recommendation so there is a fundamental difference between an adesh philosophy and an upadesh philosophy the four indian dharmas all encompassing living non living entire universe you can tell the dharma of water you can tell the dharma of fire you can't spell out for religion right uh, similarly you find there is a huge difference our concepts are not prayer and worship what we have is puja anushthan yagya or aarti they are completely different from prayer and worship the word prayer has its uh, root 
asking material things and asking forgiveness of the sins and most probably the sins are carried out against the non believers and you get a <laughs> discount discount from those religions of foreign origin for conducting those things so it's very different prayer can be done anywhere in a temple in front of a teacher or in a court of law that is also called a prayer puja anushthan yagya aarti all these are completely different from prayer and worship which is why i always believe that the places of worship act is void at the initial because this is not a place of worship now the in dharma there are specific sampradayas where you can ask for material things and that, that is where the concept of kul devi and kul devta comes where you can be asking uh, you know or seeking uh, material objectives but overall the concept of dharma is talking about individual liberation where you cannot be asking material things now again god is not a bhagwan there, there is no concept there is no concept of god in indian dharma indian dharma is about seeking the supreme values represented by the bhagwan indian bhagwans aren't some forces which exist at some unknown place like gods of religion indian dharma has point out that the element of supreme is within each of us and everywhere so we do not have we do not come from this god follower concept of worship religion is about being believing life dharma is, is talking about a karma fearing way fundamentally different concepts religions believe in concept of one life as i said whereas dharmas believe in the life cycles based on your past and current karma similarly idol is not murti idol can be of anyone can be put up anywhere you can have a poster or idol of a politician of a sportsman of a scientist uh, and so on now what we do in mandirs is not idol worship murti is completely different this is an embodied physical representation of the bhagwans for seeking and invoking the divine principle they represent right we are invoking those values into ourselves so there is a fundamental difference between being blindly following commandments and dharm is talking about the concept of darshan one is saying blindly follow what is written second is saying darshan completely opposite concept so i do believe that uh, in terms of geopolitics or geoeconomics uh, it it has been a big failure on the part of bharat and bharatiya citizens that we are not able to convey that the english language is not able to i mean it's at a, it's at an infant stage and cannot cover uh, the, the 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 indian spiritual science one is the science of seeking and another is a belief system and we are putting both of them at a pedestal at the same uh, platform so when we say the word swatantra which is self governance we got to understand that until and unless that document represents dharm you are not self governed okay so we are going to celebrate the civilizational republic day on the day when the constitution preamble replaces the word secular with a word dharmic so the word socialist secular and democratic needs to be replaced with dharmic familist and humanist so that is the time when we can say that we have achieved the civilizational republic day now we also need to understand that there is also complete narrative which is being run about caste now we all know caste is not our word it's a foreign imposition on us now jati dharm word and kul these were the four uh, elements designed in ancient bharat so that we function in an integrated way now kul is talking about your family responsibilities jati is talking about your community responsibilities dharm is talking about your responsibility towards your individual liberation and vand is talking about your occupational responsibilities now there cannot be any human being on this planet who is not going to have his family responsibilities not going to have his community responsibilities not going to have his work responsibilities so as soon as you minus out jati dharm and kula the society that you are going to get is a vocalist society 
totally irresponsible and completely dependent on the state on freebies. So all those countries who have destroyed their cool duties, jati duties, and vayana duties, they get zombie population with one cat and dog as a family and completely dependent on a state. Now, you cannot have macroeconomic principles designed in a fashion where you are a permanent in a position of uh, charity-driven or a freebies-driven state. That is, That cannot be a permanent position for any country to run. Okay? So, we got to understand that even the West today, after experimenting all this stuff, they have come up with their, their doctors now prescribe family time. Their doctors now prescribe uh, community health centers. They are building community groups now because they have seen the consequences of removing cool jati and varna responsibilities out of the society. Okay? So we need to understand that this uh, ancient Bharat model integrated science of thinking depends on this four wheels. The car is, runs on this four wheels. You cannot cherry pick and say, I'll take dharm and then I'm going to remove all other responsibilities. That's not how it happens. Okay? And, and you have this disease uh, among many experts who immediately want to become modern. And just so that they sound modern, which they relate with Westernism, they will say, let's remove all the old things without even understanding why those old things were built. Now, when we talk about... Uh, caste as a western word imposed on us where the word originated the occupation of the people was tagged by their surname even there so blacksmith barber potter tailor you still have those surnames right so these these were these were the methodologies with which you were able to locate those specific skills that is how it used to be now we are not going to say that this discrimination is something which hindu dharma brought about say for example somebody is a watchman still discriminated in the sense the CEO is not going to greet him like he's going to greet another CEO. Now, are you going to put this discrimination on Hindu Dharm? It's happening in all offices across the world, even today, right? So we got to understand that there are multiple population, 140 crore plus, one single incident happening somewhere and and especially I've seen this narrative happening immediately after the Ram Mandir because the world realizes, especially those, uh, those elements who are anti-national in nature, that if India is able to establish the Mandir ecosystem, there is going to be a lot of, lot of geopolitical tremors in terms of the economic heft that we are going to build if that happens. So... All of them started doing the narrative, anti-Brahmin narrative and whatnot, exactly at that point in time when uh, the Ram Mandir uh, event came. So we got to understand that all four Indian dharm, Indian origin dharm, we also got to understand the concept of a convert and also understand the concept of what it means by religion of foreign origin. There has to be absolutely no doubt about the fact that each and every Bharatiya citizen has, come, has got that DNA, that eyes, nose, skin, face, height, color, everything comes from Prabhu Sri Ram, irrespective of how much uh, fancy name they put on themselves from uh, adopting from a foreign country or, or a fancy dress that they put on themselves. So we have to begin a process of healing where uh, all the converts, uh, they begin this discussion within their home about what generation uh, took that problem from the invaders and which generation got converted so that we can begin the process of homecoming in a celebratory format. And, and being a person who... Uh, I can tell you that to me, the concept of Garvapsi is nothing but those, uh, those kids uh, who had went outside home now their pockets are empty. They want to come back home. <laughs> this is what my definition of Garvapti is. So, so Ankit, if, uh, I can, if I can ask you a question, how do you see the, uh, you know, the world being transformed or the impact of today's India, like from the 
era of fragile five in 2013 to be among the major five by 2023 and this entire passion driven uh, you know the passion surrounding the whole concept of awakening of, of the sanatani roots what are the say four five major uh, geopolitical you know implications of it if i can quantify if you can quantify it that way these are four five things that uh, you know you think that it might happen it may not happen in one day but the process would start yeah so so one of the themes which i see as the implication of the rise of dharm is the the theme based on which what is going on in terms of de-dollarization de-radicalization de-communism decolonization and demissionarization this is the first theme of implication that we see along with the rise of dharma now this has much to do with the concept of money why it has to do with the concept of money because 400 years back the starting point of the single country reserve currency format which began with the establishment of the east india company at the surat port okay that is the starting point of imposition of pound as a single country reserve currency. Now, humanity has seen uh, the usage of barter for trade for thousands of years, where one family unit or a community unit has to produce an end product or a service in order to exchange each other. Now, what happens with that barter? No overproduction, no underproduction, no inflation, no unemployment and no exploitation of natural resources. From there, we went to gold and silver as precious metals, which I believe is Sanatan. Gold is Sanatan because that is the real currency is what I understand. From there, the kings and the queens used to put their faces on those coins uh, to, so that people understand that this is a currency. Uh, every time they want to bring a financial reset, they would withdraw those gold and silver coins and issue cheaper metal coins. That is how the monarchs used to amass wealth. So one thing is very clear that in order to bring a financial reset in the world, uh, the basic step is collection of physical gold and silver. Now, from there, we went to a paper board of currency where uh, it was said that uh, so-and-so amount of currency would be uh, representing some ounce of gold or silver. And from there, finally, in 1971, President Nixon comes and says, no more gold convertibility. Okay, so now all the currencies of the world becomes fiat since 1971, totally printed out of thin air. So this entire journey of geoeconomics is based on the Abrahamic thought process of only one life, consumption model. If this is my, if I am the body, I need to consume everything in this life. So what happens with the Abrahamic economic models? You deploy women uh, for temporary GDP as a unit of labor. This began with the British colonialism, where they put up classroom systems mm -hmm. so that human beings are put up into four walls for 15 long years, completely unaware of the market reality. It's a job to do. So they started the concept of co-education because with the industrial revolution they were looking for uh, having slaves for the factories so when you deploy fertile women for temporary gdp what is going to happen next uh, you are going to lose all the birth rates so what has happened to the world as i said the concept of homecoming means that the money is empty the pocket money of the kids is empty so what has happened to the world is uh, all these countries, US has lost the birth rate, EU has lost the birth rate, uh, Japan has lost the birth rate, China has lost the birth rate, Russia has lost the birth rate. This is because of the Abrahamic concept of one life consumption model. Now, with that, you also understand that they believe their concept of wealth is only material factor of production. So if you are focusing on material factor of production, what is going to happen? The countries in the Gulf who are relying on free crude oil coming coming out from their soil, basing entire economy based on this, realize that by the end of 10 to 15 years next, based on the sustainable development goals and the UN climate goals, uh, they will be back to camels if they don't diversify their economy. So this is the problem with the Abrahamic economic models. 
they design all the formulas for only one life and hyper consumption now what happens with sanatan economics is we do not have any concept of individual wealth our world is sampatti and lakshmi sampatti means that which is built together which is talking about a family unit entrepreneurship model lakshmi means that money which is put to a collective usage so in sanatan economics not even spending is for individual okay now this is the fundamental difference between the two so whereas capitalism is focusing on individual is the smallest economic unit communism is saying unknown people mob is the smallest economic unit it is only sanatan economics which say i know where in adam smith the karl marx communism there is even one time mention of the word family and you are not surprised why both the theories have destroyed family as an institution wherever they have applied to be extreme so uh, not just that when you see uh, pound being shifted and by the us dollar as a new reserve currency what happens again united states collects all the gold from the european allies and then replaces pound with the us dollar again as i said the rule is set in stone that you need to first collect gold to uh, effectuate a financial reset so that is how pound got replaced with the us dollar now what happens next is uh, you have this entire concept of uh, military industrial complex after the aristocrat families from the uk start shifting their wealth portfolios to the us as a next world power to be built you realize that again yeah, Pratip, based Pratip, on... uh, just one sec uh, you have beautifully explained it uh, the concept of why family is very important let me for the audience here just uh, i mean i'll just explain a little more about what he has said his concept is very very important for everyone to understand see during the covid time in spite of the fact that the west had so such better infrastructure the reason they they failed is because there was no family to bank upon mm. how india survived is because the community was helping each other the voluntary organizations were helping each other the parents were helping uh, the, you know the larger family was helping each other or, or a, one of the reason why recessions when happens in the world it doesn't impact india beyond a point is because when the son loses the job the father would say come back doesn't matter i'll take care of you or the uncle would say come back doesn't matter i'll take care of you now in 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 us or the west by the time you are 18 you are out you are thrown out literally of the home so you don't have a family to bank upon now even if you go and say that uh, you know that um, you know how many siblings you have and you say sir three or four they'll they'll ask from the same mother and same father that is a question that is asked there so and if you see the number so for a country like you states which is which is which has the largest gdp in the world the largest largest one of the largest per capita income why does it happen that in that country people will go at the age of 20 go to a kindergarten or a college with a assault rifle and shoot to death 20 odd people what is lacking there so why and that's what ankit is saying that you live with 20 dogs 50 assault rifles you have no family to bank upon you have no sense of responsibility towards the society towards the larger family towards the community towards the neighborhood you just consume and eventually you are so frustrated you move, move towards narcotics and then you have nothing left in life your entire life is based on just consumption and watching video games you become self destructive and that is where what ankit ji is mentioning about family being one of the foundational platform of an economic model so then you don't have a concept of family so eventually what happens and what i'm saying is not my theories this is what ankit ji has said uh, that eventually what happens uh, you know these uh, so you you don't have a family you have a one life consumption model as has been propounded by ankit ji so then your population starts declining when the population starts declining you start bringing in immigrants then a large number of illegal immigrants start coming in and then start destroying the very core ethos of your own country and that is what united states is facing that's what western europe is facing so back to you i i wanted the you know crowd here you not being able to see them they are hearing yeah. you for the first time 
So I just wanted to explain in your जी words जी because जी uh, so जी that they can understand. Now he would explain the whole concept of you know military industrial complex and why for the rest of the world, uh, every five to ten years is so very important. Why the wars happen and why the dharmic concept of India can be a very good model of conflict resolution. Ankit ji, back to you. जी so uh, in the Sanatan economics model, I mean. We, if we were able to give, as I said, twenty-seven percent GDP on average for eighteen hundred years, out of the last two thousand years, that is eighty-five percent of the entire term, right? So, uh, this without English language, without having a single country reserve currency, without going outside the continent and destroying any nation, that is the Sanatan economics model because we focus on. On improving the manufacture of production, whereas in the Abrahamic economics, there is no concept of working on the manufacture of production because there are commandments based on which you believe there is nothing for me to improve because I am already following what the God said. Uh, what what needs to be changed is the rest of the world. So they come up with words like war economy. They join the word war with economy. They come up with the words like gun culture, gun plus culture, okay? Because they feel that what they are doing, being good, God chosen people, they are already following the commandment, so they can never be wrong. So what they are improving is the other factors of production, not the man factor of production. Whereas Sanatan economics, in fact, if each each one of us know that Indian parents, if you if you just uh, magnify it as a kid. Uh, अगर आप मार खा के आए हो तो भी आप से ही डांटेंगे और मार के आए हो किसी को तो भी आप से ही डांटेंगे वो बिकॉज इट कम्स फ्रॉम दिस सनातन इकोनॉमिक मॉडल के हमको तो मैन फैक्टर ऑफ प्रोडक्शन पे ही वर्क करना है ओके सो बिकॉज दैट इज व्हाट सस्टेनेबल इज नाउ व्हाट हैपेंस विद दिस इकोनॉमिक एज आई सेट दे फोकस ऑन मटीरियल फैक्टर ऑफ प्रोडक्शन दे बिल्ड दिस मिलिट्री इंडस्ट्रियल कॉम्प्लेक्स वेर देव टर्न एंटायर जियो It's into mob-based culture, mob objectives. There are only two groups. One is a group of democratic nations, so to speak. Another is a group of communist nations, and both groups need to clash. And you are being told you can you are, you can join only one group. You cannot be at both the places. This is what Jay Shankar Ji is constantly answering them uh, because he is constantly posed with that question. So we need to understand that they come from this Abrahamic standpoint. the geopolitics as well is according to them a mob and mob has specific objectives mob has specific beliefs and mob uh, and countries need to be converted and brought into that group so this concept of conversion is also brought into geopolitics okay so this is what india is denying bharat says no boss <laughs> that's not what we are going to do we we value the strategic autonomy because we are science of seeking So issue wise, we will take a stand whether we go this side or that side or what. As we are talking about how uh, geoeconomics functions in terms of Abrahamic models, where we are told that you need to join either of the group, and and that particular military industrial complex works in a way where uh, several countries are being imposed with puppet regimes, their resources forcefully uh, made into uh, contracts. For some of the companies, because this is what happens with that hyper-consumption model, that eventually those companies are going to take over your governance. This is what we are seeing in uh, not many of Western countries. Now, what happens with that? With that military-industrial complex established with those aristocrats, which shifted to the other side of Atlantic from UK to US, what happens? The very first casualty is. we need to understand that when these deep pockets enter this nation there are going to be serious serious threats to nationalist leaders uh, and you would not be surprised there will be a lot of a lot of indirect internal sabotage which which could happen when things or decision making do not go in the way this large deep pockets would want in the nation which is why i fear uh, for a lot of Uh, the second uh, line of leadership which is coming up in several states of bharat 
where there are people are discussing gung ho about who is going to succeed next in line in the position which is where i say please hold on don't don't give the address of the second line of leaders so we need to understand and the country also will have to governance will also have to figure out how we are going to make a policy to cancel out this challenges because Uh, so the, the the number of predictions that are given specifically with respect to the adani fpo i had predicted that attack 7 days before that adani fpo episode because this deep pocket as i said in extreme capitalism not number one challenge in the indian geography is family members working in the management of the company so all those family led businesses in bharat are going to be their special target when they come and settle over here and we need to be alert about it we also got to understand that this geopolitics that they did by uh, by the late uh, 60s they came with this vietnam war and that war completely you know demolished the economics of their nation with that it become compulsion for them to completely remove the dollar from the gold standard and totally printed out of thin air so on 15th august 1971 president nixon comes and says no more gold convertibility because allies told him that we want our gold back take back your us dollar so on that day all the currencies become fiat completely printed out of thin air and with that fiat dollar of 1971 the it sector is born now begins what our media used to call it brain drain which i say was not brain drain it was dharma drain according to me the nris are successful in foreign countries not because they were intelligent the nris are were successful in those countries because their concept of handling finance comes from sanatan economics model which is we are going to take care of the aged parents and we are going to take care of our responsibility for the next generation at least they finish their education whereas in the west uh, by the time they come to their classroom two three parents have already changed okay so nri is successful because their concept of handling finance comes from sanatan it is not taught in some abrahamic western classroom or their abrahamic french circle of this concept of saving model life okay so one if you if i am to give one word of difference between religion and dharm religion is consumption and dharm is preservation that's a one word of difference between the two so uh, we got to understand what happened with that 1971 fiat dollar attracting the talent from bharat over there was actually the dharm drain the benefit of which this economies had in the west now it is unfortunate that when that narrative went on about hindu rate of growth i could not find a single nri countering and saying hey boss we are the hindu rate of growth what are you even talking okay so this is what is lacking that this the slavery and colonial mindset this is what it does now by 1973 uh, kissinger goes to saudi arabia they send they sign a oil for petrol oil for security program the entire crude oil for the entire gulf to be sold in us dollar now what happens with the single country reserve currency model what happens is say suppose there are five friends who go to a hotel and say uh, let's trade i am going to pay the bill in us dollar the american friend says so everyone is happy they say okay ko karne do pay after some time the american friend says whatever trade that we do in between us let us do in us dollar everyone says yes 180 plus nations kill the demand and value of their own currency and artificially shot up the value of us dollar now two of the nations say we are working 12 14 hours we are still not able to earn the dollars to do any kind of trade even with my neighbor the american friend says i am going to put up two institutions you go and take dollar loans from them so imf and world bank now when you go for loans from them what happens there are a list of political Uh, and defense and foreign policy compulsions that you will have to do along with the interest rate that you have to pay for those loans now one of two more friends says no we are not going we are still not okay with it what happens next one is saddam hussein and second is gaddafi of libya you know what 
Now with this 1973 petro dollar, what happens? The entire clothing of Saudi Arabia women turns black. All of a sudden, what happens next? Both the sides of the roads of the Indian highways is bought by a single community. What happens next? You have Salim Javed script coming in Bollywood with that petro dollar. Now, no longer Bollywood heroes need to keep Hindu names to survive in Bollywood. What happens next? Amitabh Bachchan is showing 786 and asking questions to Bhagwan in a mandir. What happens next? Gulshan Kumar gets killed with that petro dollar. What happens next? Cities after cities, you are seeing terror attacks and the screen on TV is showing Prem movies. This is what happens. So the entire radicalization process begins with the petro dollar of 1973 where the entire Middle East and the Bharatiya Upmadweep completely radicalized by the funding of the petrodollar. Which is why I say de-dollarization will happen parallel with de-radicalization. Okay? So, you got to understand that with this, by 1979, you have Deng Shopping visiting US, President Carter, impressed with the technology, says, we want this kind of technology in China. President Carter says, first finish of your domestic consumption. Deng Xiaoping comes back, imposes a brutal single child policy in China. America starts passing the technology to become the global manufacturing giant that it becomes. And opens up the gateway of the endless printing machine with the Wall Street finance at a low rate of interest to China. With this, China starts becoming the manufacturing giant. By the, by the late 90s, the entire reserve currency bubble in the American because artificially taking up the dollar. The entire reserve currency bubble gets accumulated in the IT sector by late 90s in the US. But this time, the European allies says, boss, we want to de-dollarize. They launch a currency called Euro and US drags the NATO for a Yugoslavia war to bring the value of euro down. And now when the European allies realize this, they say we are no more going to park our savings in the US Treasury. And with this, panicked with this, United States starts changing the banking regulation saying now there's no difference between a commercial banking and investment banking, which means anyone putting money in the US account, they can uh, the bank can sweep that money into another account and start playing uh, speculative trade with that money. This is what they did to immediately counter the de-dollarization of the euro currency. But despite that, as, as the European ally said, we are no more going to um, deposit our savings in the US dollar. The entire reserve currency bubble that was accumulated in the IT sector burst violently and what in what we call as the dot-com burst of 2002. But since they were preparing China, China promised that we are going to put our savings in the U.S. Treasury. So instead of the European ally, and U.S. brings them in the World Trade Organization, giving them all the benefits of membership of the World Trade Organization, and it be starts becoming the export giant that it became. But by 2008, what happens is they have completely destroyed family as an institution in the West. They got 60%, 50% divorce rates in the entire West because the role of the father is of the dollar. The role of the kids is of the dollar. Uh, kids, uh, parents throw their kids out by the age of 16 um, because the state is going to sponsor with that endless printing machine, the Medicare and the retirement benefits, right? Uh, the kids get loans in 1-2%, so they also leave the parents home. So by, the, by, by that 2008, that crisis. This time again to bring the U.S. economy out of the crisis, they again print endless dollars. But what is the change this time? This time, the inflation which is passed on to the rest of the world to sustain the American lifestyle causes massive food inflation across the world 
and several governments start falling in the Middle East in what we call as the Arab Spring of 2011. This is the first time the Gulf realizes that they have lost about 50% of their crude oil wealth in just sustaining the US dollar by radicalizing the Middle East and the Bharti of Mahadri. Now only 50% of crude oil wealth is left and they have a radicalized society diversified into absolutely nothing what we call as a mainstream economics. So now they become desperate to start de-radicalization along with de-dollarization. By that time, to my understanding, the prime minister, I mean, the, the script began the day the visa was rejected as a chief minister. The very day prime minister said that I'm going to line up Americans for visas here. So to my understanding, the concept of de-dollarization and Indo-Pacific, both of them came from Shinzo Abe, the starting thoughts, thought process. Okay. So Japan becomes the partner country of the state of Gujarat. We begin the vibrant Gujarat summit. After five, six summits, we were ready with the Gujarat model and the prime minister becomes prime minister in 2014. Now, this is the exact opportunity the Gulf was looking for to find an international partner to begin the de-radicalization process. So the first time the UAE prince comes to Bharat 2015, he is watching here some uh, uh, this wave of intolerance discussion going on here. He goes back to UAE and announces the tolerance ministry. By 2018, he sends a prince to Akshardham in Delhi, where probably they decide that Indian yoga, Ayurveda, and Mandir is the right method of de radicalizing the entire Middle East. So they have seen the American methods of de radicalization, they have seen the Chinese method of de radicalization, but they finally settle with the Bharatiya safer method of de radicalization, which is yoga, Ayurveda, and Mandir. Okay. 2018, the Prime Minister, uh, as I said, back to 2015, the first the financial reset can only be carried out by collection of physical gold. So the prime minister comes with a gold monetization scheme in 2015 because Indians have more physical gold than the entire central banks of the world put together. So what happens with that is uh, that scheme did not work because obviously gold is what is Sanatan and people won't part with it. Okay, so that scheme did not work. So my understanding is BRICS Plus decided that since we are not going to a unipolar world, single country reserve currency international trade, all central banks can collect tiny amount of gold and we can still de-dollarize. Okay. So the BRICS nation starts collecting physical gold and silver from the West instead of gold monetization scheme, which did not work over here. Now the prime minister says, no more multilateral trade pact will only sign bilateral free trade agreements because it is very easy to flip out of the US dollar trade because you just have to negotiate with one person when the right time comes. So all the countries are line up, they negotiate a uh, bilateral free trade agreement and then you see uh, the trade moves on. So this entire, and then you see rupee and UPI card also coming in. 2018, the first time Bharat offers China to do a yuan rupee trade. At that time, Xi Jinping denies it. I think he, that was the term when he just got into uh, the Central Military Commission. So probably not that powerful like he is right now. But he rejected that idea back then. But during COVID, Xi Jinping realized that after working for 40 long years for the world, they made only 3 trillion in reserves. Whereas the United States distributed about $14 trillion just during COVID to Americans for free. One for $14 trillion. This is the point of realization for Xi Jinping to align on the de-dollarization process. Which is why you saw by November 2022, uh, the only two members of the powerful Politburo who were pro-exports got removed. One was Li Keqiong, the premier, and second was Wang Yang. And after that, we have the news that Lee Keqiong has died as well. So there were only two leaders who were pro-exports and got removed. So with that, China also aligns on the de-dollarization process. Now they tried for three long years digital yuan. It did not work. 
uh, and since nobody wants a unipolar world, neither any of the four countries, I believe, US, Russia, China, or Bharat, has the strength to give a unipolar single country world. So I believe all of them have compromised with BRICS Plus. So by the time BRICS Plus comes up with some new formula of the financial reset, till then, I believe US economy is moving towards shifting a chunk of that US dollar into the uh, Bitcoin private crypto where they have approved the ETF for that purpose until BRICS Plus comes up with the new formula. So the, some of the predictions which I've given is that you will see a complete, a big chunk of wrap up of the IT and the banking sector in the West in the coming 18 months, which is what I've predicted. Now, some of the predictions which I've also given, as I said, Mandir ecosystem will be from Saudi Arabia this side to Laos, Cambodia on the other side. So you shouldn't be surprised if in few years you find Prime Minister Modi doing Prat Pratishta in Saudi Arabia. Because as I say, Kaaba and Somnath falls in the same line and length. The Temple Mount in Israel and Kedarnath falls in the same line and length. I have absolutely, I'm not a historian. I have absolutely no doubt there must be 12 Jyotirling in Bharat and there must be 12 Jyotirling in outer Bharat in the same design. Now, I'm not a historian, but this is something that we need to research on. And the last month when I was in Israel, uh, the, it's a Jewish expert who told us that in this temple mount, uh, the puja incense sticks used to come from Bharat traveling across Saudi Arabia. And this incense sticks are being named in Sanskrit in the Jewish Bible. Clearly named. Okay? So, it's very clear that So, and in fact, I'm telling you that in this process of de and decolonization, the Gulf is now trying to find out what their ancient roots and linkages with Bharat is, which is why you saw two big MOUs, one with Saudi Arabia, another with UAE, full access of their national archives. Don't be surprised with that, the same de-dollarization route, which is the IMAC corridor, from the, the, from the same port of Surat, Mumbai and Gujarat, uh, where the single country reserve currency format started at Surat. From that very port, you will have this IMAC de-dollarization corridor, reversing that uh, single country reserve currency format, landing at the UAE port. You will have Indian railways across Saudi Arabia, Hindu pilgrimage, ancient Mandir sites being revived in Saudi Arabia, which will go to the Haifa port in Israel and across to, the, uh, to Europe. The same 400,000 years of reversal, which I say, one is that you want your exports to be only consumed by the elite in the world. That is the kind of valuation that you want, that the latest Apple iPhone should be in your hand first, and only, only the elite in the West or the foreign countries should be able to buy it. That is the 400 years of reversal. And we are looking at 1,000 years of reversal, where we say that the very concept of women empowerment begins with the empowering of the core sector of agriculture because these entire valuations were destroyed in 50s, 60s, and 70s dollarization process. Each of these fiat dollar cities were built by saying, you start asking rights from your brothers, fathers, parents, sisters, uh, and all that generation which got fooled into it, uh, they broke their family corpus by asking their share, destroyed the agriculture sector. They came and built those, these urban centers based on Western templates, handed over this corpus to companies, and they themselves became jobbers. This is the dollarization process which has happened across all countries. Okay? So all those fiat dollar cities which are built by destroying the valuation of the core sectors with the de-dollarization de process, those core sectors are going to come back to the real valuation which means that uh, this very word of agriculture settlement, which is, which is a derivation of the word marriage, where you ask uh, to settle hua, to settle hui, that comes from agriculture settlement, because women empowerment began with the discovery of agriculture, saying the concept of monogamy, that you have to work on this piece of land and uh, build a family over there, which is why humanity shifted from polygamy to monogamy. 
So when these valuations come back to the core sectors, you will be you will not be surprised to see the entire divorce rate coming down drastically or across the world. So uh, my understanding is the financial reset that we are moving towards. Uh, once the currency gets pegged, because what I'm seeing is we are moving into a world where China plus 10 in manufacturing, because it was the tor torture of the Chinese citizens that the rest of the world were enjoying democracy, freedom, right, dance, art, culture, and whatnot, weekend off and whatnot. So now as China is aligned on that de-dollarization process, you will find China plus 10 in actually, plus 10 in currencies, and US plus 10 in defense as well, because now the responsibility will be on each of the regional powers to impart the security to the trade route because US will no more be in a position to do the uh, security provision all across the globe. Okay? So we are seeing part of it in the Red Sea area where you know India in unilaterally has deployed almost a dozen ships, but is not part of the Prosperity Guardian Alliance of United States. True, true. So uh, as we move towards, as I say, in this process of the process of decolonization means that. When I'm going to sit on a bilateral with a China, with a Chinese foreign minister, what I need is to see that each and every Mandir is revived within China. Now, what happens with that de organization process is a huge amount of their manufacturing sector is going to be hit because they are over capacity. Because as we know, in this lopsided unipolar world, entire manufacturing was with China. And the entire printing of currency used to happen in the West. So as we move towards the multipolar world, uh, the services sector and the manufacturing sector specifically in China is going to be hit, which means a lot of unemployment coming back to the family unit entrepreneurship. So as a bilateral with China, the relation that I would want is, hey, you are going to reverse 1965 cultural revolution, which means whatever dharmic practices which were India influenced within China, and whatever linkages with ancient Bharat, you are going to put it in full public display. And second is the reversal of 1979, which means you are going to split manufacturing with Russia, Bharat, and remaining nations. You are not going to have an overcapacitated manufacturing. Similarly, in the Middle East, as you move towards the de-radicalization process, eventually you should be surprised uh, if you see uh, as each of these rappels fly, uh, you know, flew through UAE, and the UAE Air Force did a mid-air refueling for those. I won't be surprised in a few years if it's hundred percent interoperable with the Indian Air Force. So I see a subsuming of the UAE Air Force with the Bharatiya Air Force. I see a subsuming of the Saudi National Combat with the Bharatiya Army, and I see a subsuming of Iranian Navy with the Bharatiya Navy in terms of 100% interoperability going through the next three decades. This is what how I look at it. And the predictions that I've given is UAE is going to be the first Hindu country, Saudi Arabia, a Jewish majority, and Iran, a Christian majority by 2040. Um, I have many predictions. I mean, this is the one which is relevant over here. It's very interesting. Um, and it's, it, it's uh, mind-boggling to take so much in one session. Uh, my only question, and I'll just ask the audience, uh, of, most of the audience here are very young people. Uh, uh, I'll just ask you one question. Do you see any, because I don't think the established powerhouses would let it go that way, uh, even though it's inevitable. Do you see any major conflict coming up somewhere? Uh, we see a lot of conflicts right. happening in silos, but any major thing concerning India or anything uh, that well, uh, should be worried, worrying us? Well, uh, these four conflicts which I've predicted are very clear. That is Ukraine, Taiwan, POK, and Iran, Israel. Because these were artificial hotspots created to just keep the single country reserve currency status going. Pound and then dollar. Okay? So, you're not surprised. Europe standing at Russian borders. Russia standing at Chinese borders. China standing at Indian borders. India standing at Pakistan borders. Pakistan standing at Afghanistan borders. Afghanistan standing at Iran borders, Iran standing at Iraq borders. So 
in in my book which i explained as a two bucket theory to keep the single country reserve currency format going first the britishers and then the americans they made this two bucket one bucket of nation got arms and dollars second bucket of nation got sanction so each of the country was told that your neighbor is a rogue country we are going to sanction them and which by default means that you have to continue with the single country reserve currency so in this politics this four artificial hotspots were created ukraine taiwan pok and iran israel so i see reversal of all four hotspots which is the military conflict which i foresee which is very understandable based on the two bucket theory uh i'll ask the audience if you have any question uh you know ankit ji would be a little short for time if there's any question you can ask mm -hmm. uh you can just ask the question i'll try tell it to him because we don't have that option today of uh, yeah actually thank you sir from jamia india sunday i am an international relations student so recently in november 2023 at world hindu congress thailand team says that world peace can be established only through hindu values yeah so so ankit you could get that question sir yeah i i i want to complete yeah yeah okay so why we can't have sanatan or vedic centers abroad just like china is promoting the chinese civilizational yeah. culture through confucius centers yeah so his question is should we not have these uh, vedic centers um across the world in fact in one of the meetings in a place which i cannot name here that was one of the suggestion that we had given and i'm sure in due course of time uh, i think ankit will agree that much yeah. like the confucius institute concept that the chinese came up with uh, we might see the vedic centers or uh, be uh, institutionalized would, yeah yeah i'll i'll like to give a little bit of background here yes because there's a it's it's very unfortunate that we we as a civilization have to borrow the world superpower from the west because they are very young they're just infant nations just 500 years old okay now understand the difference between the concept of superpower and the concept of vishwaguru superpower means that uh, your foreign minister when he visits some nation the bombers are flying from the top and he is negotiating so this is the concept of domination this is the concept of hard power this is a concept of imposition of policies on nation the concept of vishwa guru is totally opposite the concept of vishwa guru comes the word guru comes from the one who takes you from uh, darkness to light so the vishwa guru concept is about all those nations coming to you and asking ke guru ji aap humko batayi policies mein hum kya rectify kare it's complete different one is a domination and imposition and second is the science of seeking that you want to guide now based on the patrata of the disciple the guru will decide how much to di disseminate and how much to teach now as per this question that is what is asked i would say that uh, we are yet to reach that position it's, it's going to take 2047 because first you have to show that economic might first you have to reach that economic might before countries come to you asking for your guidance uh, in your region certainly bhutan nepal sri lanka bangladesh these nations might come for that uh, that kind of guidance seeking process but to become a vishwa guru it's going to take 2047 now the institutions that we need to build certainly but my understanding is there is one blip and that is the crusades that will happen in you so my understanding is uh, bharat is rightly placed uh, to get into that crusades and solve their problem if we are able to bring that science of seeking across europe when that crusades will be ongoing i don't think before crusades we have any interest to get into that but we do have we have to prepare our geopolitical assets uh, in number that we are able to go there and uh, help them out so we have sadguru with us we have shri shri with us we have ramdev ji with us we have nita ambani with us these are our geopolitical geo economic assets but we need them to be in large numbers enough so that we can offer something like the concept of bharat for you what bharat can do for you which is what the prime minister says the vishwamitra concept right. uh, any other question 
Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. You have beautifully explained that what is the difference. Uh, speak between, a little louder. Uh, difference between uh, dharma and religion, but uh, there is a uh, uh, two more terms uh, which is more confusing to me, sir. And that is uh, what is difference between Sanatan dharma and Hinduism. And sir, hmm. uh, one more question is that uh, is yoga is a, a interrelated or related with any religion? That how we can see yoga is uh, hmm. is it related to with context to any religion or not? Hmm. So, uh, first we have to understand that you do not mix the concepts. There is a big difference, as I explained, between religion of foreign origin and dharma. One is, one is a belief system and second is science of seeking. Now, science of seeking involves questioning, which is why your entire literature is about people questioning each other. Okay, And that is the nature of an uh, Indian citizen as well. Now, in religion, you have to first become an atheist if you want to become a scientist. But in dharma, all our gurus were scientists because it is based on the science of seeking and questioning already. That's a natural order. So when you say that yoga, is, whether it is uh, related to some religion, it is not related to religion. It is 100% related to dharma. Okay? Because it is about the inner engineering of, your of the human body which is where we say that we are working on the man factor of production. We don't focus on the material factor of production. Okay. Similarly, uh, the next question, the first question what you asked was? Sanatan Dharma and uh, Hinduism. Hinduism. Okay. Now, understand one thing. Uh, when all those people who came searching for us, they came searching for us because, uh, uh, again, the, the, the narrative is Sone Ki Chidiya. When they say Sone Ki Chidya, understood that we were wealthy. But the word Chidya comes from the derivation of Ki Iska Kabza Kiya Ja Sakta Hai. Which is why I say ke we need to focus on Sone Ka Shed, not Sone Ki Chidya. Now, when we say that uh, they come searching for us, what they had in their hand was geographical description of what India looks like. So, be, be it Himalayan uh, the mountain range, be it the Indus civilization or the Bhartiya Mahasagar, which they call as the Indian Ocean. So based on this, they came up with the terminology of Hindu, from Sindhu, Hindu, that kind of derivation, Indus. Okay. So now this is the popular uh, identity tag that you have got. But as long as Dharma is concerned, it is about Sanatana. And why it is named Sanatan? Because that what sustains till eternity. That that where you cannot locate the starting point and the end point. With that, what is sustainable? So Sanatan is what is the reality. Okay, which is why we have the Kal Chakra, right? We say that uh, based on that uh, in Jainism also they have in my Dharma Jainism we call it that as a. a Ausarpini and Utsarpini cycles, which is what uh, uh, Hinduism says as the Kal Chakra. Okay. The, so it's the same for all the four dharmas. So there's no difference between the two other than that we are identified as Hindus based on geographical description that they had because they were lost. We were not lost. We were living here only. They came searching for us and they named us based on geographical description. It's their problem. So basically, Sanatan Dharma means eternal duties or eternal responsibilities. That, so that's what Ankit Ji mentioned. That it is, in, it is very much in contrast with the concept of religion um, that perhaps came from elsewhere. So one uh, is a rights-based society, and second is a duty-based society. Yes, and interestingly, just want to elaborate what Ankit Ji mentioned. If you look at Shiv Puran to Bhagavad Gita, all were conversations. You know, it was you are you know so you seeking you are not you you have not theorized that you know he is lord so you are asking questions clearing your doubts then you are believing that okay you are when you are convinced so that is a very important aspect so that's what uh, Sadhguru says that we are a nation of seekers and not believers yeah yeah uh, Ankit ji thank you so much my question uh, so there is one question from Alok yeah Alok uh, I think you are on mute so how would I how would he Yes, sir. Yeah, Ankit, uh, Alokji, please. Yes, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for such an insightful session. And uh, extremely thankful to Patikrit Pine, sir, for arranging this talk. Sir, 
one of the uh, articles written by Patikrit Paine sir, uh, the play behind the plot, in which he has extensively talked and he has tried to deconstruct the various narratives which are being made by, with, by various Western media, uh, NGOs and other aspects. So sir, I would like to ask you, how do you feel that similar to the concepts of de-dollarization, de-communism and other aspects, how this the entire ecosystem or the entire framework about which you have talked today, that will be impacted. The impact of uh, civil society organizations with uh, mainly in the Western world and the Western media, how that can be influenced by this. Also, sir, I'm Alok Tiwari. I am currently part of Chanakya Fellowship in Social Sciences at Chanakya University, Bangalore. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, the entire question is based on the piece which is written by Mr. Patikrit Pines. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. So, uh, understand that this entire narrative thing, it's not just about the indexes. I mean, they've got all the indexes wrong, by the way. Uh, the per capita, if one person has the entire wealth, still the per capita number of the country is going to come the same. So almost all the indexes are wrong. In fact, GDP itself is also wrong. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that, but you have other talks where you can check out. Um, so my understanding is that this entire missionarization and radicalization process outside funded, particularly from that endless printing machine with that single country uh, privilege that they have, single country reserve currency privilege. Not just that, I mean, uh, if, you, if you just want to jot down the kind of damages that is being done, about you'll find about 1,500 scientists being killed, not a single one with a Russia or a Chinese uh, trace. Okay. Similarly, you will find the last five to six years, uh, entire funding of the startups and the e-commerce was done from the Wall Street finance with that endless printing machine to ensure that the offline shops get completely destroyed in all the countries. So we were wondering how we are getting products below cost, despite the fact that these companies were never in profit. So you can understand the kind of damage. This was not just NGO conversion and there were multiple facets to this endless printing machine. Because offline shops have this fixed set of different salary, uh, that electricity bill, the shop that they have, the fixed assets that they have to buy. Okay, so this entire uh, printing machine has done a lot of damage. They took our entire merit to the IT sector, uh, made them do fully tasks. So someone who's a mechanical engineer still joining IT sector because they are getting that uh, US or maybe a little lesser than US level pay scale. So they ensured that the entire talent was lured uh, to the IT sector. The other sectors got destroyed in terms of giving any productivity, patents, or innovation. Whereas they had the printing machine. To their businessmen, they were able to give 1%, 2% rate loans, which is why they were able to do Google and Amazon and Apple and whatnot. Okay, Because again, with the single country reserve currency privilege, they were able to print it endlessly and give loans at low rate of interest. If Indian... Uh, which is why I say that the financial reset, after the financial reset, when we will be able to give, which is what the Prime Minister also came up with, uh, the Mutra Yojana, the Startup India, and uh, this time the internal, uh, the budget which was declared by Nirmala Ji, 1 lakh crore courses at a very low rate of interest for 50 years, which is 1 lakh city or Aage Badaenge, right? So then we will also be able to do the kind of innovation which they did. So as much the control of currency that you take in your hand, the more you also will be able to do innovation because you'll be able to give at a lower rate of interest to your businessmen. So coming back to that family unit entrepreneurship model is very, very important. The, the stock market capitalization is a proof that your education uh, sector that you designed on the British classroom model has completely collapsed already, that the parents do not find their children investable enough that they hand over the savings to the company. Okay. So uh, I believe in this reversal. The education sector will see a revamp. I'm very confident in the third term, you will see a big revamp in the education format. There is no need of doing this feminization of men process for 15 long years by testing memory at all. There's no need of a mafia giving stress of admission and fees to the parents at all. Technology can be used and the fees can be brought down drastically. There's no need of teaching anything which does not have anything to do with the real market making money. Okay, So these are the big changes which the Prime Minister already hinted that the third term will have a thousand years of impact in terms of 
the policy change that he wants to bring about. So we are looking at 400 years of reversal and 1,000 years of reversal. If we are able to go back to that position of family unit entrepreneurship uh, out of the job model, which is a one life concept again, uh, we will be able to build that because it's Bharat of 2047, a grand, magnificent Chakravati Bharat. Okay, we'll just have one more question because Ankit would have to leave. Uh, yes, sir, you have rightly mentioned that family is the basic unit of the society. But the mm -hmm. unit, this institution of marriage, of family, uh, marriage has gone a substantial change in the last few decades. How mm -hmm. would you see that? Well, uh, my understanding is this had a lot to do with the services and the job model with which uh, the society was designed with the dollarization process. Uh, with the de-dollarization process, as you see, a lot of lot of services sector uh, jobs uh, reducing while the core sector gaining valuation. So farming, food processing, logistics, manufacturing, space tech, defense tech, precious metals, these are the ones who are going to boom like crazy. Okay? And while on the other hand, if the government takes back the control of the currency with the de-dollarization process and the break, you will find low rate of interest rate loans coming to the kids. And if you're also going to give education sector reform, where you don't have to do the rat race of 90%, 95%, 99%, you don't need to test memory at all. If you join all these dots, I think it's not going to be a big problem uh, to bring men and women both onto an entrepreneurship model. And once you have the steering wheel of economic activity in the hands of women and men uh, in terms of entrepreneurship, I don't think the concept of marriage will have as many troubles as we are seeing today. Ankit, thank you so much for your time. And it's been a real pleasure, but I think one is not enough. It would be great if somebody, someday in future, uh, you can come down to the campus uh, you know, here in sure. Delhi. And we would have a bigger audience. We would have, uh, you know, we would love to have, uh, you know, in-person interaction with you. It's an honor every time to listen to you. Thank you so much on behalf of Dr. Shama Prashad Mukherjee Research Foundation. I'm sorry, but this is a virtual one. Otherwise, we would have felicitated you with, uh, you know, all kinds of books that we have come out in the last few years. And it would be an honor for us to have you in person uh, in our campus. Thank you so much, Ankit, for your time. Thank you.